We are continuing in our reading of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. If you remember, he had been teaching, he had been healing, and he called his disciples, his newly banded group of disciples together. He took them up the hill, and a crowd followed because he had been healing, because he had been touching them, because they had seen things in him that they had only hoped for from God before. And as he tries to teach his disciples, they gather around. So his words are for his disciples, but they are also for the crowd who would become his disciples. We're beginning at verse 13 in chapter 5. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to the whole house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I was packing up to move, I had help from the last two congregations I served. People came out and helped me. They were amazed at the number of flashlights that I owned. We had them in a small container that got bigger, and we moved them three times to a bigger container. And they said, why do you have so many flashlights? Well, it was because I couldn't find a flashlight and mentioned it in a sermon once. <laughs> You mentioned that in a sermon, and suddenly you were gifted with flashlight upon flashlights. I talked about not being prepared in that sermon because it was a day when suddenly there was a siren outside that got louder and louder and louder, and I had been watching television, and the emergency broadcast came on. Not a drill, but the real thing, and said that there was a tornado heading directly through Hedgesville, West Virginia, where my home was. I put my dog on a leash because I didn't want to say, Toto, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. And we headed toward the basement, and the one thing I could not find as the lights went out was a flashlight. Now, luckily, the tornado passed by my home, and most of the other homes were spared in that community. But I mentioned that in a sermon, and now I am the proud owner of probably 35 different flashlights of different sizes. I was not a Boy Scout, can you tell? Because what is the Boy Scout motto? Be prepared. Be prepared. Let me hear that from that little Scout. Jeremiah, was that you back there? What's the Scout motto? Be prepared. Be prepared. Now, the, founding, the founder of Scouting was a British soldier named Robert Baden Powell. And he founded the Scouts there in 1908, and then they moved to the US in 1910. And people heard his motto, be prepared, and they said to him, prepared for what? You know what his answer was? Why, for any old thing. Because he said, if you are a Boy Scout, be prepared means you are always in a state of readiness in mind and body to do your duty. Listen to that again. You are always in a state of readiness in mind and body to do your duty. Pretty good for a Boy Scout, even better for a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, what did Jesus say to the disciples and the crowd around him? You are what? You are the, you're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. I looked it up. There are 14,000 uses for salt. We're going to name them all this morning. No, we're not. But what we're going to do is we're going to divide, you are the salt side, you are the light side, salt and light. Talk amongst yourselves. Come up with some of the things that you know about salt and some of the things you know about light. Go. Choir, you can pick which side you're on. 
talk, talk amongst yourselves. What are some of the things salt can accomplish? What are the things light can accomplish? OK, what, what can salt do? It can preserve. Amen. What can light do? Help things grow. Help things grow. Amen. What can salt do? Clean. If you've ever tried to get a cast iron skillet clean, the thing you do is you pour salt in it, dry salt, and you rub it around until it's clean. What can light do? Like light from a fire. And is there anybody here who does not look better in candlelight? I know I do. <laughs> Give me another salt. It's out a fire. It what? It's out a fire. If salt can put out a fire. Sorry, light. They can get you with that. What about light? Give me another light fact. The sunlight makes you feel happier. That is physiological. It raises the serotonin level in your body. And without sunlight, people start to become depressed. There's even something called seasonal affective disorder that hits a lot of people in wintertime because they need more sunlight. Another salt thing. It what? It keeps cows alive. They put salt blocks out, and you can see the deer are saying, yeah, there's no cow around. I'm going to take a lick here, because that helps your muscles. Salt is absolutely vital for your body. What else about light? Solar panels can power your house. You're all smart. Anything else about salt? It preserves. Seasoning. Have you ever had potato chips without salt? Why? or popcorn without salt. What else about light? What moves faster than light? Nothing moves faster than light that we know about. What'd you say, Rob? <laughs> salt and light. Jesus says, if you stop being salty, you might as well be thrown out and trampled on by the horses. But you know what the truth of the matter is? Salt can't stop being salt. Light cannot stop being light. And who would light a lamp and put it under a bushel basket? Now, we're not talking about the lamp that John had up here that you plug in and turn on. What would happen to a first century light if you put a bushel basket over it? It would either snuff out the light or it would catch the bushel basket on fire. Jesus was making a joke. We're so afraid to laugh when Jesus makes a joke, but he was making a joke. Because why would you bother to have a lamp? And oil for lamps was a very precious commodity. Why would you bother to light a lamp and then cover it up? So what is Jesus saying? He is saying to them that this is who you are. You are salt and you are light. Not you have the possibility or the potential. You have it within you to be salt and light. He doesn't say that, does he? You might one day achieve saltness or lightness. He says, this is who you are. But before we go into that a little bit more, let's look at what this passage is not saying, because there are some troubling passages, especially in the gospel lesson this morning. Because it says, do not think, these are the words of Jesus again, I have come to abolish the law of prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. And then he says those words that if they didn't strike you hard, they should have. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And we go, uh-oh, uh-oh. Because the scribes and Pharisees spent their entire lives studying the scriptures. They knew them by heart. They had memorized them. But you've got to remember why the law was given and why it wasn't given. The law was not given to punish people. The law was not given to restrict people. The law was given so that we might be led to the God who gave us the law, so that we might understand the grace that caused the law to be given because we had fallen away and God so desperately wanted us back that God gave us a way to get there. It was about establishing a right relationship between people and God, but also a right relationship between people and other people. And the kingdom of heaven is not heaven in the sky after we die. It's not our final destination. It's not whether you're in or out. 
This is really the fuller understanding of what the kingdom of God is. It's not about the future. It's about right now. It's about making God and Jesus Christ the center of our being and proclaiming the lordship of Christ above all else. It's the right now of living out the right relationship between ourselves and God and between each other in honor of God. So salt and light are about relationship and identity. Because is salt salt for salt's sake? No. What does salt do? Have you ever had a recipe that you made and left the salt out by accident? Like a chocolate chip cookie and you think, who needs salt in a chocolate chip cookie? If you haven't had it, you, you know it's missing. The smallest amount of salt enhances the flavor of other things. And I'm so glad we didn't have a bad winter, or the first thing you would have said about salt is what? Melt you melt it on the ice. Or in the summertime, it makes ice cream. Salt and light exist for the things around them. They don't exist for themselves. And Jesus is saying to that crowd, to the disciples, to the 12 that he's called specifically for the life and work of disciples, but to the others who come to him because they've seen in him something they've never seen before. And he says, this is who you are. You are salt and you are light. You are the ones who cleanse. You're the ones who preserve. You're the ones who give guidance. You're there before anything else can reach need. You are salt and you are light. The little children sing that verse, hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine. But just as we are light, we sometimes choose to hide our light under a bushel basket. Sometimes we don't shine as brightly. Sometimes we don't want to be up in front of everyone else. Sometimes it's because we think that we don't want to be arrogant. We don't want to be the goody two-shoes Christians. We don't want to be judging other people. And those are all good reasons. But they're not reasons not to let your light shine. Sometimes we like the darkness, don't we? Because if you want to get away with something, you turn the lights down low instead of up brightly. But if you want to really know what it is to stumble in the darkness of discipleship or to put the lights on brightly, we had that lovely passage from Isaiah, one of my favorite passages from all of Isaiah. This comes from the last part of the book. Isaiah is really divided into three sections. The first is, you're going to get it, Israel, because you've not been faithful. Up till chapter 40, because suddenly they're in exile and they're going, up. Oh, he was right, we're in it now. But as soon as the people realize their sinfulness, what does the good prophet do? Starts proclaiming that God is going to restore. Begins at chapter 40. Comfort, comfort my people, says the Lord your God. Tell them that their time of suffering is past. How does that chapter end? God will raise them up on wings like eagles. They will walk and not be weary. They shall run and not grow faint. But what happens when the people get restored? They suddenly start acting up again because they forget. And they have come back to the temple. They've had to rebuild the temple, but they're coming back to worship. And they're saying, what's the point of all this, God? Why do we get up early on Sunday morning and drive here to Epworth? No, 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 that wasn't right. Why do we make sacrifice? Why do we humble ourselves? Why do we put on sackcloth? Why do we roll around in the ashes if you're not even going to look at us and tell us what good people we are? And God says, you think that's what I'm looking for here? That's not what the law is about. That's what got the scribes and Pharisees in trouble because they thought that was what it was. They forgot the God who had given the law, and they were all about the law. If I check this box and this box and this box and this box, I will be righteous. I will be in. The rest of you will be out. And I don't really care what happens to the rest of you because I know where I'm going. And God says, that's the stuff that makes me sick. That's a paraphrase. But God says, as if you practiced righteousness as a nation. And then God says, this is what you do if you want to live in the light. Is not this the fast that I choose? Is not this the worship and the way to live in a right relationship that I choose? To loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the homeless poor into your house, 
when you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin. That means if your brother-in-law wants to borrow your saw, you let him borrow it, even if you don't think you'll ever get it back. It's about the way we treat other people. It's about not participating in the suffering of others. But not just that. It's not enough to say, I'm not a racist, if you're not going to do anything about racism. It's not enough to say, I have never cheated anyone in my life out of their income. It's about making sure the poor have what they need to survive. If you ask the kids up here when they come up for the children's sermon, if you see somebody who's hungry, what do you do? You know what they're going to say? You feed them. If they don't have a coat, what are you going to do? You're going to give them yours or buy them one. That's what little children always say. And the one I love the best, if you see somebody who's homeless and doesn't have a home, what do you do? They don't say give money to you can. They say you take them home with you and let them live there. That's what children do because they give off light. But what does God say happens when this is how we live together before other people? God says, then your light shall break forth like the dawn. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help and he will say, here I am. Now remember, these are people coming out of exile who had cried out to God and God turned away because of their faithlessness. But if you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger and the speaking of evil, let that be a lesson to those on social media, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil. If you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in darkness and your gloom be like the noon day. You will shine. And that's not a you that's an individual you. That's a plural, because he's talking to the disciples. He's talking to the crowd, because those who follow him willingly are given a new identity. They don't have to live up to being salt. They don't have to strive after being light. They are salt, and they are light. End of story. I've seen a lot of salt and a lot of light here at Epworth. When we looked at the number of people we've served this year, we just did the statistical reports, we stopped counting at 2,500. We put 2,500 people plus served by Epworth. Babies getting hats at GBMC. Families getting Thanksgiving dinners. Children getting backpacks at school time. Families being helped at Christmas time. We helped a family whose father had been deported out of the country, but left behind a wife who was here legally and children without any income. We gave them Christmas dinner and a few presents for their children. That is what it means to be salt. That is what it means to be light. And that's what it means when Isaiah writes, you shall raise up the foundations of many generations. God speaking through Isaiah. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets to live in. So how do we do this? What's the secret to our saltiness and our lightness? It's what Paul says when he writes to the church in Corinth, to a body of people divided who are arguing over who's better, whose gifts are better. And again, just like the scribes and Pharisees, seeking after things through the doing of the letter of the law instead of seeking the God behind the law. Paul says, I could have come and I could have out-talked all of you because Paul was a Pharisee. Paul was a learned man. I could have come to you with lofty words. I could have come to you with eloquence. I could have come to you from a position of authority. I could have come to you as one who is above you. But what did he write? When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. We are not called to measure ourselves against each other in our faithfulness or even our faithlessness because the standard bearer for our actions is Jesus Christ, the light of the world that no darkness can overcome. And if we walk in his light, we cannot help but reflect that light to others. So my question to you, is you going to hide it under a bushel? Oh, my golly. <laughs> Hide it under a bushel? No. What are you going to do? Let it shine. Let it shine. 
let it shine. Some of you are a little saltier than others. That's pretty cool, too. But you have the light of Christ in you. For the love of Christ our Savior, please let it shine. And then you will, thank you, Jeremiah. Do that for everybody to see. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let's stand up and sing that now. You want to come up and sign it with me? You learned the signs. Come on up here, Jeremiah, in your scout uniform. Carrie, you want to do it too? Anybody else, any of the other little ones here?